Well, it's a great pleasure to meet you, Ryan Burrows. Uh, you're head of uh, personal investing for the UK, Vanguard. Now, um, I was absolutely blown away by your product, I've got to say. Oh, thank you. So I'm going to be embarrassingly uh, in praise of your product today. Um, so maybe you'd just like to tell us about why you chose to uh, introduce Vanguard's new product, Vanguard Direct, right now. I guess I don't, for us, it'll always go back to uh, to our mission. So the way we define our, our mission is to take a stand for all investors, treat them fairly, and give them the best chance for investment success. And so while we've uh, been doing that in the U.S. for a long time, I think now we've really started to think about how could we do that more broadly for, for global investors. Um, now, as in terms of why specifically now, you know, we've been... Uh, uh, very deeply present in the UK market for 10 years. So we uh, moved our headquarters, uh, European headquarters, to London in 2009 uh, and have been serving uh, financial advisors and other institutions since then. Really, um, over the past uh, three or four years, post the uh, retail distribution review yeah. uh, from the FCA, which created a lot more fee transparency, which is really important to us. Uh, we felt like it was the right time to begin to serve uh, UK uh, individual investors directly. And uh, I love the um, the transparency of your fees. So let's just talk about the fees sure. that you have. So with Vanguard Direct, you pay just 15 basis points yep. in order to have an account held by you. Well, and I, I, I suppose that, you know, I'd probably start if, if I'm an investor, I care about my, my all-in in costs, right? So that'll include the what you pay for funds or ETFs uh, or your investments and what you pay the administrator or the platform. Um, so our platform fee is 15 basis points or you know not 0.15 percent um, of the uh, investments you have with us but it's capped and that's one of the things we're really really proud of so so above 250,000 you don't pay any more so that's 350 pounds and that's it yeah 375 pounds is the exactly. maximum you could pay and when, when we looked at the platform space in the the uk you know there were lots of platforms that were you know they charged that percentage point but then it kept going for a long time. So it actually got quite expensive if, if you uh, were a more affluent investor or you had some platforms that had a, 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 you know, more of a constant fee. But then that was quite expensive if you were a smaller investor. And so you know, our goal is to make uh, investing accessible and low cost uh, for everyone. And so we really wanted to combine a structure that made it sort of work both for people who are newer to investing and those who may be you know, further down the investing path. So with Vanguard Direct, the deal is that you can only buy Vanguard funds. So as long as you're willing to be in that Vanguard playpen, and I've got to say it's not particularly limiting because yeah. you have almost every choice of equity region. Uh, you have different asset types, so you have credit funds, yeah. and these are geographically based as well. Uh, so you have a very wide selection of funds, but it is limited to just Vanguard products. That's correct, yeah. So Vanguard uh, funds and, and ETFs only, but I, I think just to... to talk more about the point you had there's a, a bit of a misconception i feel in the industry that diversification is achieved by you know owning several fund managers um now it could be a way to diversification yeah. but it's not necessarily if you owned six uk equity funds you probably just created a uk equity tracker <laughs> fund uh for yourself and you're not really as diversified as you might be whereas if you own the vanguard life strategy 60 percent equity fund in that single fund you own global equity markets and global uh, bond markets all in one single wrapper. So it's actually quite diversified as a, as a, from an investment perspective, even though it's a single, a single fund. I've heard some people describe it as a kind of uh, frozen meal where you get everything. You get the beef, you get the gravy, and you get the potatoes all in one, all in one thing, pre-diversified. Yeah, so it, it's it's having it all in one spot. We think we think making investing less intimidating is really is really important. And there's a lot of I think uh, companies in the investment industry who have an, uh, an interest in making it seem complicated. Um, and you know, while there's certainly a lot of nuance um, in certain areas, we think there's some core principles that everyone should understand, right? And so for us, it's, it's goals, balance, cost, and discipline. So you know, number one is know why you're investing. Um, and it's, you know, many people don't know. And you, you want to invest differently if you're investing to, say, buy a retirement home in five years versus if you're investing for your own personal retirement in 40 years, right? So you need to know that. Uh, balance is, is around, you know, making sure that you have the right asset allocation for that level of risk. You know, cost we've talked a little bit about. We think it's the one factor in an investor's control that has, a, has an impact on their future returns. And then discipline is about not, not panicking effectively. Um, you know, so stick with, stick with your discipline with the allocation you've, uh, you've chosen for the long run. 
But it's kind of like staying in the roller coaster. So when markets do dip, you don't panic and sell. Yeah, and and that's the, the, the what the life strategy funds, and that we have a target retirement fund, which does a slightly different thing. But they're you know what we think of as kind of those broadly diversified uh, investments within one fund. Do is it takes care of a lot of the discipline stuff for you, so it'll keep that same asset allocation that you chose that that matched with your goal without you having to do anything. So it's it's quite user friendly, uh, I suppose, from the investor's perspective. If you don't want to be you know yourself keeping track of hey, is my equity fixed income allocation out of whack which most investors probably won't want to do. Uh, <laughs> so rebalancing can be a real pain because if you, if you do have a strategy, then it, let's say the equities rally more than the bonds, then every once in a while you sell some of the equity and buy more of the bonds. That's right. Yeah. So if, and it's all done for you. If we just, you know, if we, if we, you and I took a time machine back to, to March of 2009 and had decided yeah. for our, our level of risk for whatever we were investing and we wanted to have 60% equity and 40% bonds, if we had just bought that and then forgotten about it, I don't know what the exact number would be, but it'd be probably closer to 75% <laughs> equity and 25% bond now. And so the fund does that within it. So it keeps that constant level of, uh, well, it keeps the, f the fix between equity and bonds, which is really what we think the best way you control the, the risk and the volatility within your portfolio. So if I bought one of your ETFs, so let's say I bought some kind of UK yeah. equity tracker. FTSE 100. FTSE 100 tracker from Vanguard through another provider. Now for that other provider, they would charge me some kind of holding fee for holding the, um, the fund within their platform. Now yours would probably be lower, so that'll be about 15 basis yeah. points, 0.15 percent as we've already discussed. But there's also the trading cost. So one of the really amazing things about Vanguard Direct is that you aggregate everybody's trades over a day there are two ways of trading, yeah. right? So one way, which is the good way to do it, which I didn't do, oh. is you do this kind of aggregated trade. So you aggregate everybody's trade, and then what's the fee for that? So that's that's free for the uh, the investor. So just uh, say that again. Yeah, free for the free, 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 free. for the investor. Okay. Or no right. additional cost. We charge okay. you the fifteen basis okay. points. And okay. We want to be clear about that. But you know, we're we're really we believe in long term investing, right? We believe for most investors, you should buy and hold for a, for an extended period of time. Um, and because of that, you know, if you, even an ETF which is traded on a market and you could buy it at 9.30 a.m. or you know, 3 p.m., if you're going to hold it for 15 years, you're probably pretty indifferent to whether or not you bought it in the morning or the afternoon of a specific day. And so because of that, we want to make it easy for people to access those ETFs, which I know could potentially be intimidating for, for investors who are, who are less familiar with them. Okay, so that's one way of doing it, the smart way. Yeah. Now, I did it in a dumb way, and you do get charged a small fee for that. I think it's about... Seven pounds. That's right. The, the other way to trade is called quote and deal, um, quote and which deal. effectively means that you can ask, depending on whether you're buying or selling, but let's say you were, you were buying, you can say, show me what the price is right now, and then we'll give you the, the quote. So it'll be you know, whatever it is, 15 pounds 20. And then you have 15 seconds to say, yes, I like that price, or you can let it, let it expire effectively. So okay. it lets you know exactly what price you'll pay. But because we we route your order to market individually, so we can't aggregate them at scale. We, yeah. we charge the, the investor effectively what our cost is to do that for them. Okay, I did it the dumb way. So uh, another thing which I love about your website, but which is difficult to find, is the education piece. Now, there are some really nice tutorials about asset allocation. So my background is in asset allocation, yeah. so I know a bit about it. And it was just very clearly done. But I had to dig to find it. So it's great if you can find it. Uh, is that one of your focuses going forward? Certainly, edu education is a big part of what we what we want to do. Just from a pure mission driven perspective, um, there's a lot of things going on in the UK, and it, it's a very um, you know there's a there's a lot of things thrown at individuals between pensions, freedom, and you know yeah. people have fewer people have defined benefit pensions at their at work, yeah. um, new tax wrappers, the tax limits change, all those types of things, and so. We want to do everything we can to help people focus on the things that will help them achieve their investment goals. And, and one of the things like low cost, for example, like low cost. And it all goes back to goals, balance and cost discipline. Yeah. Right. And so part of it is just having people know that costs are important. Um, and there's you know, one of the, the I think, a, a fallacy that we're, we're a bit sensitive to is that, you know, when people hear low cost, they, they think cheap necessarily. And that's, you know, our, our, our strategy, which is a, is a great one if you can execute on it, is to be both the lowest cost and the highest quality. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we think actually low cost leads to high quality in investments um, because you are keeping more of your money as opposed to the person who's managing the investments. Because the unbelievable thing about compounding is it works against you as well. So if you're paying 1% every year for the next 40 years, 
that complex. It, and it has a massive drag on your returns. It does, and it's 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 uh, it's it's. You generally think as an investor, one percent that doesn't seem like much, right? But it's that one percent doesn't grow then for the next forty years, and then you know, so it would be a significant a significant sort of difference versus a much lower cost portfolio. So I mean, if you're looking at long term returns of the equity market of around seven percent, let's be optimistic, maybe eight yep. uh, percent. If you've got a two percent fee that you're paying an active manager, that can erode your value over the long term massively, right? That two percent over. 40, 50 years of investment can be really brutal. And that's, well, that's the way we think of seven or eight. I'd be, I, if I could sign up for seven or eight <laughs> percent right now, I would, I would sign up. Um, you know, we, the equity, equity markets have had a really good run for uh, yeah. the, the last eight years, as, as everyone knows. But I think the way we think about it is fee. So we, our, our best guess is that a balanced portfolio between equities and fixed income will return about 5%. Well, we shouldn't say that because it's it's a distribution around that. Sure. That's the kind of that's sure. the middle of the distribution. But let's just assume it was five percent. If you're paying two percent in fees, the way we think about it is you're paying forty percent of your return to the investment manager, right? So that's you know that's a lot, and we prefer for your you know because the investor is the one who's taking the risk at the end of the day, right? Yeah. It's their money, and so we think the investor should get the benefit of the return from that risk instead of the investment manager. And if you consider inflation as well, then suddenly that fee becomes. Yeah, kind of tipping point between yeah. profit and loss. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So education will be a part of the part of the website. Do you think? It is. I, and I, you know, I think we we are working on how can we make it more prominent because it's you know we, we do need to make it a bit easier easier to find. So I, you know. I, I, <laughs> I mean, the other thing I noticed as well was that uh, it was quite hard to find the duration of the uh, some of the funds. So, mm. for example, when it has, I mean, obviously for the hundred percent equity, I wouldn't yeah. expect the duration. But if you're looking at bond risk. This idea of duration is very important for calculating your risk. It so, is. I mean, if you have a duration of one year versus five years, that increases the sensitivity to interest rates massively. Yeah. And if we are about to see interest rates go up, that's why I'm kind of paranoid about uh, duration at the moment. Yeah. So I actually have to look it up. It's around nine years, I think, for some of the some of the Vanguard funds, the life strategy ones. Yeah. So in general, our, our funds like Life Strategy that hold bonds will hold an, an aggregate type bond index. Yeah. So it'll have the, the mix of you know your your thirty ish year plus you know government generally yeah. right because yeah. corps generally aren't that long, um, you know so that'll be a, roughly the duration of the market of fixed income if okay. you if you will, um, and you know so one of the challenges we always have that we're we're trying to do as best we can is how do we serve you know people who may be much more knowledgeable about in, investing and in, in sure. those who aren't right and. You know, so most people will probably, you know, not understand yeah. the um, your audience base. Sorry, don't don't mean to uh, do insult, the, insult the people that are out there. Uh, but um, you know, so duration is a relatively tricky tricky concept, okay. and so we focus probably more on the hey, know how much you're balancing between equity and fixed income in the first place, right? Yeah. And do people understand that? And we think of bonds as almost like ballast in your portfolio, okay. right? It's you know, you don't. For most people, won't invest in bonds because they're trying to make a certain return. You're making it to reduce the volatility of yeah. your portfolio, and then the equity component is really sort of there to, to build on a lot of the returns. So it's like cash plus. You know, you just get cash, but so low volatility, but a little bit of extra income. Yeah, but, corporate and, and you know, to your point with you know, uh, Bank of England rates at 25, yeah. 25 basis points, which is no doubt lower than inflation. I mean, in, in kind of inflation-adjusted terms, you're you're losing money on cash. So hopefully, it'll at least keep you above. You know, where you're making money and kind of inflation adjusted. Okay. So uh, maybe you could talk briefly about the mutual structure in the U.S. Because I know in the U.S. the people who invest in Vanguard funds actually own the company. It's kind of like a cooperative almost, right. yeah. uh, as we call it here in the U.K. But in the U.S. it's a it's a mutual structure. But that doesn't extend to the to the U.K. That's right. Yeah. So you know, the when Mr. Bogle, who is our, our founder, I should say Jack Bogle, who's you know may be known to some of your uh, your audience, founded Vanguard. It was founded on the the concept of low cost and simplicity and transparency. And and really the the concept is is Vanguard got bigger. The benefits of that scale because we can be more efficient should get get back to clients. And the mechanism for that is we lower our costs. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is it is technically mutually owned. Uh, well, it, it is mutually owned in the U.S. And it's not mutually owned here in the same way, in the sense that our UK investors don't own the management company. Now, practically speaking, you know the management company isn't traded on the public markets. There's no way for our investors in the US to kind of uh, sell the management company, if you will. The real benefit they get from the long term is that the prices have declined as the companies got bigger. And so what I would say is while the, the actual investment structure is different, the philosophy is exactly the same. I started with Vanguard in the 
in the U.S. and it's not, it feels exactly the same to me from a culture perspective. And our goal in the U.K. is just as much as it is in the U.S. to lower the cost of investing for investors over time. And so I think that the practical reality will be very similar to what it has been in the so U.S. You're not a member of the club, but you still get the low cost. But it, yeah, our, our goal is to lower the cost. It, 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 cost is not the benefit to investors, right? Investors don't invest to get low cost. They invest to achieve their outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. We just think low cost is a way to help them achieve their investment account. But it was, so is education. And so, sure, sure. you know, our goal is to help our investors achieve their investment outcomes and keeping costs low and, and uh, over time is a big part of that. So when I opened the account, which I did almost straight away after you, after you launched it, um, I opened an ISA. So I put in the full limit of my ISA. Yeah. But there are two other products that you offer. I think one of them is a junior ISA, if yep. you want to save for your children. Yep. So it's a kind of very nice tax efficient yep. wrapper for saving for your children. Um, the other one was just like a, a general account, which is not inside an ISA. That's right. We would just hold your funds, but not in a tax wrapper. Yep. So I think you're also planning to launch a SIP. Is that the case? We are. Yeah, we're, we're so working, what is a SIP? working on it now. A, a SIP is a self-invested personal pension. Okay. Um, so for you know any, anyone in your audience who may have a, what's called a defined contribution pension at, at work, it's a similar pension structure. And what that that means generally is you get a tax benefit uh, on the on the way in. So the contributions go in tax free. So you can. Uh, you get a, basically a top up from HMRC, if you will, on your contributions, end. which is great if you're a high high rate taxpayer. I it guess. is, yeah. 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 And then on the way out, the, the the tax bit gets a bit more complicated, but there's yeah. some tax advantages when you withdraw from your pension as well later in life. So it, it's definitely something. It's it's clearly a retirement vehicle, right? Yeah. So if you are thinking about saving for retirement, uh, a SIP is certainly something that you you would want to consider. So I mean, if if you think about your um, target audience. I mean, I've, I've spoken to various robo yeah. funds, and a lot of them have a very clear idea in their head of, okay, my, my kind of client is a tech savvy person yeah. who's maybe 40 years old. Yeah. And what's your kind of envisioned customer, if you like? Yeah, that is maybe the, the question I've been asked most <laughs> over the past uh, several years. And we, we, we think about it differently, in, in all honesty. So yeah. the, we want to attract investors who we have a perspective on how to invest, right? We're not just here to make money. We don't offer the latest fund that's getting a lot of cash flow. We believe there's a right way to invest, and it goes back to those investment principles. We're trying to attract investors who believe in our way of investing mm -hmm. um, because we think it will help them achieve their goals, and that's going to be we have young folks, we have older folks, we have wealthy folks, we have folks who have you know their whole thousand pounds of savings with us and everything in between, and we're more than okay with that. Yeah. The things that are important to us are we want you to invest for the long term. We've intentionally not designed our service to be great for people who want to, you know, dive in and out of ETFs, right? We don't have level two quotes and sort of all the all the things you'd want to do if you wanted to be an active active trader. Day trader. Um, yeah. You know, we want people who want to buy and hold and invest for the long run. So that's the that's the important thing for us. Now, to your point on the, the sign up, and thank you for yeah. saying, saying it was it was easy. That was one of our goals too. We think we wanted to make it, you know. Right. Consumers compare everything now to what they experience in all walks of life. So we didn't want to just compare ourselves, the, the service digitally, to other investment management companies. We wanted to try and make it as easy as a Google or a Facebook or an Apple. And could we continue to make it easier and more digital for clients to, to use as well? And it's so much more beautiful than your other website, which I think yeah. you're going to phase out. But you've you done a really beautiful yeah. job on the design. So you can see the breakdown of the sector risk. And you can also see the regional breakdown of your portfolio, which I think yeah. is just fantastic. Yeah. I'm not sure it's particularly useful, but I mean, I, yeah. I, I found it very reassuring. Well, James and the team who did it will be very happy, very happy to hear <laughs> that. So I, will, I had I had personally nothing to do with it. But, but I mean, even uh, your yeah. term sheets were ugly. I don't like to say yeah. this, but even your term sheets were ugly. You know, iShares term sheets, very pretty, but the Vanguard ones are quite, quite minimal. But this website just blew me away. Well, and I think that's, you know, we are, as we serve more individual investors directly, we do have to go back, you know, the term sheets have been with the funds for a while, and, you know, there were fewer individuals using them. And so as we become better at serving individual investors, we'll continue to think about how could we do that better, and how can we make it easier, and how could we make it more straightforward and get the information in a, in a clearer way. Okay. Uh, is there anything that uh, you think uh, is kind of shaping the markets at the moment? Because I think one of the things we discussed before was what drives people into passive funds and out of active funds. Yeah. And you were saying that it's actually the market activities or the movement in the stock market which usually drives people towards passive. Yeah, well, you know, if I step, when I uh, read some of the material that's out there in the market now, people will say, well, you have to be, yes, you could keep your costs down, but 
you know, they, they almost position investing like a luxury good. You get what you pay for, right? <laughs> so it's not the, you know, you have the four seasons and you have the travel lodge, <laughs> you know, but that's not the way investing works in, in our perspective. And so, um, you know, for us, it's really about low cost and it's not about passive versus active. It's just, you know, effectively, if your fund manager, or your platform or whoever it is, is charging you 2%, you didn't have to outperform by 2% to recoup that. That's not that's not free. And so our perspective has always been the lower you can keep the cost of investing, the better your chances of investment success. And so I guess if there was one thing to highlight, it's that we would want everyone to understand their all-in costs, both on the, the fund side, the platform side, and then if they pay an advisor, what they pay their advisor. Um, and then, you know, after that, there's there's real sort of differences between passive and active that, that you know, they, they both can be right in different different situations. And I realized I just never, haven't defined passive active. Would that be helpful? Yes, I don't let's, know. let's talk about that briefly. Just, just, just say what it is. Yeah. So, you know, a, a, a passive fund is really meant to track an index and in general meant to replicate kind of the, the market. So we, we, so it's so like you buy the whole stock market. You, you almost buy every account. stock that exists. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's sort of logical conclusion. Now for a, a, a benchmark like the FTSE 100, which investors may have heard of, that's the, the largest companies that are in the UK, right? So that's, but you could also buy the FTSE 250, which is smaller companies. And so, but you're basically saying, I'm not trying to pick individual securities that I think are going to be well. You know, the market, as you mentioned before, over the course of the last hundred ish years, has gone up about seven or eight percent. And I'm comfortable with that seven or eight. Again, no guarantees that it'll be seven <laughs> or eight percent. Um, and it, um, but that I, that's what I'm trying to buy. An active fund. Uh, they're effectively saying, I'm trying to pick the stocks that are going to do better than the others to do better than that 7 or 8%. Um, now, the the after cost, and I think the after cost bit track record of, of active funds you know, globally hasn't been as great, right? So, and, but our perspective is that it's largely due to the, the cost, right? So, you know, we believe that active can be a, an important part of an investor's portfolio, but you have to be really good at... Um, the manager bit and keeping your costs down. And that's where we think we can add a lot of value because as an individual investor, we use a firm called Bailey Gifford you know, here. That's, it's a, it's a great active manager. As an individual investor, I can't sort of, you know, send them an email and say, Hey, I'd like to come in and interview the portfolio manager and see if he or she is going to do a great job managing my money, but we can, right. And so we have the ability to do that kind of selection process on behalf <laughs> of our investors to find, you know, who, what we think are the sort of top quality uh, active managers in the industry. So this kind of whole active passive debate, um, I think for the average active manager, you'd pay something like 1.3, 1.4%, whereas with a passive fund or your, one of your passive funds, it's usually less than 0.2%. So usually yep. about seven times cheaper or 10 times cheaper, yep. which has a massive effect on, on returns. And then the, the question about whether they can actually outperform is, is, is a contentious one. But I think the SPIVA uh, survey in the US tends to show that most active managers don't manage to beat the market uh, when you take away their fees. Yes. And, and they're not consistent the also, yeah. also, also over time. I've talked about that a lot. Yeah, I was going to say, it's that one, <laughs> that's another one. If, if you're, what we, the, the active funds, you tend to see people, you see cash flow go into funds after they've had a good run of performance. Yeah. People chase chase performance like the Pied Piper. Yeah. Kind of and then when they have bad yeah. performance, people sell them. And so, you know, even if on active, on average, an active fund has outperformed over 10 years. It's really important that investors stay invested over that whole 10 years, right? If it's a fund that you believe in and a manager you believe in, stay the course would be our advice. But you know, don't choose certainly based on the past year or two years or three years of performance because you know the data would indicate that that's not a great predictor of future outperformance. And choose a veteran who's been through a couple of business cycles maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so last question for you. I know it's almost like sacrilege to say that, uh, you know, Vanguard would do active, but in fact, you do have several active offerings. So one of the things is a style set of style funds. Yep. So you can have things like momentum or value. Um, but, but the idea here is that you just choose a style of investing. So it's a subset of the equity market. Uh, would you like to expand a little bit on, on why you did that? I can do. It. Yeah. So we have the, the, the style uh, funds are all ETFs, so they're exchange traded funds. Um, but the, the and they're equity only. Equity, equity only. Okay. Yeah. But at this point, so why did we launch the uh, what we call the factor, the factor ETFs? Yeah. Um, so the the short version is that the sort of the academic research, the PhDs who really look into sort of securities performance, would say 
there are some things that over uh, the last, call it 30, 40, 50 years, have outperformed, right? So we'll take value as an example. In general, companies that trade at a lower premium to their peers, right? So if you have, you know, uh, if you take grocery stores as an example, if the average grocery store trades at 12 times earnings to price, if you buy grocery stores that trade at eight times earning the price over time, that is outperformed, right? And so what that uh, ETF does is it takes that factor, right, and says we are going to invest in companies that trade at lower multiples than their than their peers. And the academic literature said over the past 30 to 40 years, that has outperformed companies that sort of trade at multiples above theirs. But as anything in investing, there's no guarantee that sort of <laughs> the past will indicate the, the future. But that's the, the logic behind them, if that makes sense. And you have a fairly wide selection of those kind of pseudo active funds as well, don't you? There's, I think there are four. There are, yeah. So, um, uh, I'll put you on the spot and I'll ask you to listen now. So we've got value, value. we've got momentum. Liquidity. Liquidity. And then I'm forgetting the, the, the fourth one. It is um, minimum volatility. So oh, I'm volatility is a popular one, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, apologies. Um, and so, yes, they're all different different things. So momentum, again, the, the thought process is something that has risen recently will continue to rise. Uh, Which tends to work, over the Again, it's, it's not because we believe yeah. it. It's because the data indicates that it has worked, you know, in the, in the past. Um, liquidity is actually things that trade less frequently. That tend tends to, to be small cap stocks, doesn't it? Yeah, they tend, have less liquidity. Tend to have a bit of a premium associated with them because, as as investors, you generally want to, you know, how how easy it is to sell is important. So, if you are a buy and hold investor and are comfortable holding something over a long period of time, that's less important to you. So, if that's something you're uh, comfortable with, that you can uh, potentially capture a small premium over uh, over historical ETFs. So the kind of general principle is that you have some kind of risk premium, and by will it being willing to put your capital at risk and taking that risk premium, yeah. you harvest the return for taking that risk. So it might be the fact that it's cheap or it's small or it's a liquid, uh, but these are just allowing people to harvest all those different flavors of risk premium. That's right. When you raise an important point of there is risk there, right? It is additional risk, and, and you should be re rewarded for that risk over the long run. But the one thing I would highlight for, for any investors, I mean, I would say if if you understand investing and you can read that and it makes sense to you and it appeals to you, they may be funds for you. If you're a, a newer investor, I, it, you know, it may not be the right product for you because it's really targeted at, at investors who, you know, understand uh, more of the more of the kind of research. You don't have to sort of be able to cite Fama in French in 1972, <laughs> but you know, if you want to understand it, it, it or well, do at John John Cochrane's stochastic calculus <laughs> course, which I did, which was very unpleasant, yeah. uh, but very interesting. Um, and then the minimum volatility one's interesting too, because that's there you, you're combining different assets, different stocks to reduce the overall volatility or risk the daily, daily price move of the fund. Uh, and a lot of people have found that over, the, over a long period of time, people have found that that has performed fairly well. Yeah, you know, the, the minimum volatility bit, I think I would say the, the, the key factor is less the outperformance of that one than it should have lower volatility than, you know. So, so that's more of a safety So, so that's, that's less of a we are trying to outperform the market as opposed to we're trying to achieve a certain level of performance at a sort of lower level of volatility for, yeah. the, for the, the, the investor. So some people buy EM funds that way. They, they, they want the exposure to EM growth, but they want low volatility. So they go for some minimum volatility. Yeah. EM so growth. that one's a, a, a different one in the sense of it's not the target isn't to outperform perform okay. it's to have sort of the same performance or, or similar performance at, at uh, lower risk but you know the minimum volatility is, is a good example the minimum volatility fund will likely outperform when the market is doing well versus a, an index fund and will likely uh, overperform when the market is doing less well because it's you know that's effectively what it's meant to do so when there's a kind of panic on you go for the minimum volatility product because yeah, it's not quite that easy, right? Because if it, you know, if everyone did that, that, <laughs> you know, there's no free ride in investing. Um, so it's, you know, you need to hold the, you need to hold it over the long period of time. You know, so I guess that hopefully that didn't come across as if the markets go down, run out and buy the minimum, the minimum uh, uh, volatility yeah. fund. But yeah. okay, this will go out with a with a with a warning that says, yeah, it's not investment advice. I think that's that'll be clear. Yeah, yeah, and that's and I think for any of the the active strategies, I just say read the you know read the key fact sheet. We have you know information about what the strategy is, and, and you know, just I would recommend making sure you understand it first. Okay, well that's been fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. I yeah. really enjoyed. No, thank it. you. Hope we meet again. Yeah. Um, thank you Great. very much. Cheers.